All right. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here today. Um, this is the first global change seminar of this academic year, and that's hosted by the Southeastern Climate Adaptation Science Center and us, which we are the Global Change Fellows. Uh, my name is Samantha Michlitz, and I will be moderating this seminar. Um, and also to just to provide a pretty smooth flow of the seminar, I ask that everyone remain muted with your camera off and save any questions you have until the end. Um, you can put them in the chat or you can also private message any questions you have to our person named chat monitor. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with Zoom, at the bottom there is the mute button on the far left, which is our microphone symbol. And then also next to that is um, the uh, no screen option. And then in the middle is the chat box. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. So today we have Ms. Co Barrett, and Co is the Senior Climate Advisor for NOAA. And in this role, she provides strategic advice to NOAA to ensure agency alignment and extend capabilities to provide the best climate services to address climate challenges. She represents NOAA's idea to transform the economy, reduce emissions, and stabilize the global temperature. For over 15 years, she has represented the United States by negotiating and adopting climate science and policy outcomes. Some of these areas include serving as lead negotiator with the United Nations Treaty for Climate Change, the first woman to serve as vice chair on the IPCC, and has overseen climate policy in over 40 countries and many more impressive opportunities. And today, Ms. Barrett will be speaking with us about NOAA's new agenda to build a climate-ready nation and what all this plan involves. Um, so at this time, uh, Ms. Barrett, it is yours. You have the floor. Thank you. Did you say you go by Mick? Uh, Samantha Michaelitz is my name. Yes. So Sam. Okay, Sam. Sam, okay, great. I thought I, heard, I misheard it. Okay, hey everybody. I'm really happy to be here with you today. Um, it's great to talk to this, this group of um, ch climate change fellows. And also I'm happy to be associated with the Southeast Climate Adaptation Center. Um, and I just wanna talk with you uh, briefly about uh, this new initiative that we have. We're just kicking off at NOAA. Um, that is something I hope I can entice you to um, give us feedback on and also be involved in because as you'll learn, um, the approach that we're taking is something that really, um, in you know, takes a village to um, to build the kind of services that we need to solve this huge existential problem we call climate change. So, really looking forward to the um, Q and A time that we'll have together at the end of this brief presentation. So, let's go to the next slide. So, climate ready nation. Um, is uh, a vision that has, that we've developed. Um, by it, within NOAA across every single part of the agency because climate touches everything that we do. You know, we have a fishery service, climate and fi like fish are moving because of climate impacts. We have a weather service and the connection between extreme weather and climate is one that very many people are focused on. Uh, we have an ocean service. So all of the changes that we see, you know, happening to the ocean, which acts like a sponge to absorb excess heat and um, greenhouse gas emissions. So, um, so really this idea is drawing on every aspect of what we do as a organization. <clears throat> and in fact, involves knitting together all of the climate related capabilities that we have in place across all of NOAA and helping to support a more coordinated, coordinated service delivery approach that gets our information out into the hands of people who need it. Um, so this is what we already do, and we've been doing this for decades, but this initiative will increase the alignment so that we can really extend the value of our existing work and help us to clarify and tell the story of NOAA's kind of authoritative role in providing um, the underpinning of science and information to um, spur effective action. So we also think that this climate ready nation vision is can help us as an organization to lean into the role to to stretch and to reach to expand our service delivery. Um, doing it through a you know very clear climate lens. Um, and this means kind of bringing together um, 
uh, leveraging the work that exists across all of NOAA with the goal of bringing it together in a way that will help our nation become more fully empowered to thrive in the face of change, which brings me to this vision statement. <laughs> um, because, and you'll notice here that we've like very carefully crafted this statement so that it's about thriving. It's about, um, you know, continued growth um, and building better understanding. It's, it's crafted in a way to kind of avoid the doom and gloom that we often feel are, we're burdened from when we think about um, climate change and what a challenging um, problem we're trying to solve. So the idea here for us would be to target service delivery to states, to communities, and tribes across the US, to support other members of the federal government in climbing proofing their investments, working with business, academia, and the private sector, creating an army of climate practitioners, um, and a piece of this too will be like continuing to advance our efforts to create a climate literate public, empowered to take action in their own lives and spheres of influence. And we'll do this through a lens of equity to ensure that the agency and honestly the federal government um, is meets its mission and benefits all Americans. And too often we fall short in meeting the needs of underserved communities who are often the most vulnerable to climate change impacts. And um, I'll just talk a little bit later on about how happy I am to see this concept really living in some, some of the ways that we're proposing to move money. Um, with regard to this vision, I'm very, um, I, I really believe strongly that NOAA is uniquely positioned to execute on this vision. Um, we have, uh, Earth system science capabilities, including global observations, mapping, environmental data, applied research, you name it. Uh, we've got a whole suite of capabilities that we can bring to the table. And we have a number of on the ground activities um, where we're interacting with users and we're seeing this growing demand um, where folks need um, product services, decision support tools, that they can use to inform their decisions to reduce climate impacts. Um, and through partnerships you know, and co-development of knowledge, um, we believe that we can really you know, work to achieve um, the goals of this vision. So I will just say that I believe the time is right now to execute on this vision. Um, I'm sure if you've been involved in, in the climate world at all, you know that uh, we believe that this next decade is critical time to address the climate crisis. We really have to transform um, the global society um, in order to shift to a carbon neutral economy and hold climate impacts in check. Um, and with increased climate funding and prioritization, we have a once in a generation time to advance climate services across this nation, including for the most, most vulnerable. So let's move to the next slide. You know, as we've put together the Climate Ready Nation, we developed a, a, what we're calling a few hallmarks. So the, fir the first, first is focused on information availability um, while highlighting the importance of equity. And this is intended to enable decision makers and citizens to have equitable access to the climate information products and services they need and a clear understanding of what this information can do for them so that they can address the problem. And the second piece is really focused on taking action based on that information. So, you know, so that decision makers and citizens are empowered to take the range of actions they need, adaptation actions, mitigation actions, and at the scales they need to systematically prevent or reduce the negative impacts of climate change. So that's kind of you know, two major aspects of what we're envisioning here. And let's go to the next slide. Did the, um, did the oh, there we go. Okay, I was gonna say, did you guys see it? Okay. Um, so um, it's this administration, uh, the Biden-Harris administration, is really taking a whole of government approach to combating the cr climate crisis 
Um, and actually, when we think about it at NOAA, we think of it as a whole of society approach is needed. Um, as a member of the federal government, we're working hand in hand with many others in a whole host of activities. I, I can't even go into them. There's just so many working groups and initiatives. Um, but it is really clear that President Biden has demonstrated the administration's commitment towards taking action on climate change through the executive orders you see here on the screen. And most recently through the kind of once in a generation dedicated funding through the Inflation Reduction Act and previously through the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law that starts to excel and accelerate this needed transition and creates well-paying jobs grows industries and makes the, con the country more economically competitive. And the, these concepts are things that we are like really embracing in the climate ready nation concept. Because um, we hope to extend this to reach all segments of society and provide them with the information and tools that are needed. So let's dig in here. Next slide. So um, when we at NOAA started to think about how we should pursue a climate ready nation, we kind of hit on these risk areas. Because um, there's strong support across NOAA for these, because these risk areas um, are very much what we do or in our daily work. We provide information products and tools for this range of things. But importantly, um, the we think that focusing on these risk areas can help to form tangible sub goals that can build on the climate ready nation theme. So for example, right, a drought ready nation, a flood ready nation, um, climate ready coasts, um, you know, climate ready marine resources. Um, you know, that's a, that's a really um, nice way we think to focus in on specific actions that help us to make California fire ready by the end of the decade, for example. And you know, we know this isn't exhaustive and it doesn't represent every possible climate risk and it doesn't show the way that many climate impacts are kind of cascading or interrelated. Um, but we feel very comfortable that this is an important aspect of a matrixed approach that we're taking. Next slide. At the same time, um, that we're looking at these risks, we know that we have to keep partnerships and engagement and work with end users in mind if we're gonna be successful in creating a climate, climate service enterprise. This big enterprise of activities that includes so many different actors solving the problem. So, um, so here you see that we've focused on serving the needs within the Department of Commerce. NOAA sits within the Department of Commerce, which gives us a particular opportunity to kind of work on financial asset risk management, working with the private sector, which is another one of these areas that we're focusing on. And I know you can't read the, the icon, so I'll walk, them, walk through you. So the Department of Commerce, working with other federal agencies uh, who are looking to climate proof their investments, for example, we're working with the Department of Transportation who is right now committing billions of dollars to improved infrastructure uh, to be resilient to future climate. Um, we're targeting service delivery to state and local leaders, um, including leaders in communities, academic institutions, NGOs across the US. And this is something you know, that you guys are right there on the front lines of and you know, can really help us to up, identify opportunities and ways we can work together. Um, we have a strong focus on engaging with tribal communities, uh, recognizing the value of traditional knowledge and um, simultaneously the fact that climate change poses particular threats to indigenous populations. Um, we will be working and we are already starting to work with businesses in the private sector to enable a robust pri public private um, service delivery enterprise that really extends delivery um, much further than we can go alone. And importantly, is empowering the public to take action in their own lives. I mean, sometimes we look at these big initiatives and we, we focus on very big outcomes without recognizing that the role that we as individuals play, and in particular, the role that we take in our communities 
can be really powerful and um, be an important way to motivate people, to make them feel like they're actually making a difference and seeing that difference. So, um, so we very much you know, want to do what we can to, to make science available and products and tools available to anybody who needs them, including individuals. So let's uh, go to the next slide. OK, I know this is an eye chart, um, but um, what you have here is um, what we're calling the value chain for um, service delivery. Because you know, within NOAA and with our partners, we really um, provide the capabilities that, kind of, that go from very basic observations um, to data collection, to analysis and application. We develop product lines. Um, we, you know, we bring that whole thing to service delivery and co-developing knowledge. And so this matrix is also super important to the way um, that we intend to guide the implementation of a uh, climate ready nation. So I'll give you an example. Um, you know, NOAA is a place where we have some state of the art climate uh, scientists who are modeling the future. Um, building predictability into um, the delivery of services is something we really have to pay attention to. We are uniquely capable of doing that uh, because even the climate that we're preparing for today is going to change as we are um, solving this problem. So we've got to continue to build the, the um, knowledge about how we, things are predicted to change into our service delivery. Next slide. Um, so uh, I just want to kind of talk a little bit here about the significant funds that we've received from the um, bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act to work on climate change. This is an overview from Bill and it includes like the critical support uh, that we are enhancing for climate data and services, as well as making our, our coasts resilient to climate change. Um, IRA funding will continue and enhance many of these efforts, um, as well as um, enhancing investments in climate resilience, adaptation and mitigation. And it will support not just uh, NOAA's climate action, but also individual and community action around the country. Next slide. So as I'm sure you are well aware, some communities are already experiencing the extreme impacts of climate change. Uh, Eleanor and I recently visited Alaska uh, where we have a new pilot project um, that emerged from some climate inequity roundtables we held with the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium. And the project, um, which is called Expanding and Connecting Tribal-Led Climate Change Capacity to Serve Indigenous Communities, um, will establish a tribal climate change initiative um, and, and put a, in place a director for climate services at the organization. And, you know, I mean, just a visit to indigenous communities who are so vulnerable uh, and who are seeing, you know, the effects of, of climate change right now is, it's a pretty powerful thing. I'm sure you guys know that, you know, temperatures are increasing in Alaska four times the global average rate. So um, the changes to sea ice, um, to their way of life, to melting of permafrost, it's all just happening right before your eyes. And, um, you know, it's, a, it's very interesting. It's a small community spread across a very large area, and, um, but the needs are great. And it's just a good example of, of the kinds of things we really need to engage in. I'll give another example on the next slide. Um, which is um, the, climate, the recently released Climate Mapping for Resilience and Adaptation tool. We call it CAMERA. Um, and this is something that NOAA and the interagency group developed um, under the auspices of the White House. Um, and what it is, is a centralized hub of information to aid in planning and implementing climate resilience 
in, a, in federally funded projects and programs with specific relevance to these two big um, pots of money. Um, it provides county level data um, on um, these five um, risk areas, um, heat, drought, floods, uh, fires and coasts, and um, provides prospective grant recipients uh, with the information they can utilize to ensure potential government funded programs and projects have accounted for climate hazard exposure and planned actions. You guys should definitely kind of dig into this. Um, it's a really powerful way to combine um, resilience and adaptation information with funding opportunities. Next slide. And this is just to say, um, you know, we received, NOAA received about $3.3 billion in the Inflation Reduction Act. Right now, we are spending a lot of time figuring out what specifically that will be going to. We have, we have it pretty much sorted out. But, um, you know, 2.6 billion of it is going for climate ready coasts and oceans. Uh, we'll spend about 150 billion of it on investments in research, um, <clears throat> building that um, value chain that I referred to in a previous slide of capabilities and moving information into the hands of users. There will be some research grants that we're targeting um, as well as enhancements to high performance computing facilities, et cetera. So next and last slide. So um, look, as we, as we execute on this vision, uh, we recognize it will require broad participation and continual improvement and evaluation. And only with the deep sustained engagement, including with all of you, will we be able to kind of develop a shared understanding of the needs and a coordinated approach to the solutions that are needed to tackle climate change. So, you know, um, I hope the rest of the time we have here uh, can be a chance to hear from you, your questions, your comments um, about this, but also just about, um, about, you know, anything that's on your mind. I'm happy to kind of dig in topics that are helpful to you as you um, undertake your studies and, and work on this important issue. So thanks for having me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ko. It was a great presentation. Um, at this time, we can uh, take any questions. You feel free to unmute yourself or drop it in the chat to everybody or a chat monitor. I see a lot of names and um, pictures, but I don't see very many faces other than you, Sam. <laughs> Any other live people? I think she has it turned off. Oh, okay. <laughs> we, we can't show live faces at this point. Okay. All right. Well, I won't hold it against you then. Um, <laughs> could I ask a question, Samantha? Sure, go ahead. Uh, Dave DeMaster, uh, I'm wondering what kinds of monies have been set aside for climate change education. I love the idea of a climate ready nation, but uh, education is a big part of that. I, I talked to a number of people that uh, are still believing all of climate change is due to sunspots. Yeah, okay. So um, yeah, so that's an interesting question. Um, so do you mean like um, like education, like what you all are doing at your university, or are you thinking also about um, training? Because um, we are very much focused on um, you know building this workforce of educated practitioners who, and um, who can be working in communities to help address you know the priority impacts that they folks have identified for themselves. Uh, but we do have some K-12 um, education efforts. I have to say, it's it's not a strong focus of the of the money that we we're the new money we're receiving. We have um, we have an education office that invests in some of this, and clearly, we have, for example, um, internship programs and fellow programs 
where we bring folks in to NOAA and train them up on this topic. But I, I guess I'd, I'd benefit from understanding more specifically about what you're talking about and, and what need in particular you'd like us to think about. Well, I, when I talk to younger people, most of them are fairly aware to climate change. When I talk to some of the older people, um, depending on which political persuasion they are, um, I get a lot of resistance to science overall and uh, very little knowledge of climate change at all. Uh, as to what's forcing it, they don't believe it. You know, it's like wind, wind turbines. They believe that they're no good because they kill birds. And there's just so much uh, conspiracy theory out there that uh, in order to make a climate ready nation, I think we've got to fight back a lot of these conspiracy theories. And, uh, and I think some of the people, uh, you know, over 30, over 40, that are more set in their ways, probably need that education more than, than some of the others. Yeah, it is a challenge. Um, I mean, I will say though that, you know, you identified how, how climate literate um, youth are, and that's a huge power. Um, you know, in my work, I've, uh, you know, worked with many youth groups, Fridays for Future, et cetera. And I'm just so impressed with how literate they are on the science uh, that underpins the need for action. So that's kind of a, a, a bright spot in a somewhat dim, uh, dim view here. But I will say this, there's some really interesting research about how to educate people who, um, who don't believe in climate change. Uh, because it turns out that people come to the topic from their value, from where they stand in terms of their values. So IPCC, and I'm associated with IPCC, so let's use that as an example. IPCC sure. can put out a new report that says, with even greater certainty, we know that humans are causing climate change. And for groups that don't believe in the United Nations or in climate change. Um, or in science. You, Overall. Or in science, <laughs> yeah, or in science overall, using that information to try to persuade is just entirely ineffective and actually works against your your aims. You really need to work um, like information is best imported in those cases from a trusted member of the community, somebody who who they are already in alignment with, um, who can somehow get through. And I'm I'm thinking about there was a. There was a congressman from South Carolina, I think his name was Bob Ingle, and he was just bucking the system, a Republican congressman who, you know, was working within conservative groups to talk about climate change because he was one of them and had much more effect than, say, somebody who's an outsider could ever have. So, you know, you kind of have to figure out what are the inroads for people, um, you know, where they already kind of invest their trust. Thank you. Good question, though. And we we also have a question in the chat that says, you mentioned how the IRA and Bill will support research towards climate ready nation. Could you elaborate a little bit more on who will collaborate with universities or other partners to utilize the funding for climate research? Yeah, I can't really, um, I can't really give you guys insight before we make the announcements and things, <laughs> but um, I can kind of just, um, I can say that um, the, every one of the risk areas that I illuminated on that slide, so droughts, floods, heat, uh, wildfires, and investment in um, climate, you know, um, climate ready coasts and um, working to protect marine ecosystems, each one of those are receiving enhanced funds uh, through Bill, the combination of Bill and IRA. Um, in addition, there will definitely be funds that will be going to um, support uh, communities so that they can um, 
build resilience. Um, let me think. There will be money that flows to create this continuum of moving data out into the hands of users. Um, and I think, you know, before the end of the year, we'll be putting out an announcement that kind of hits all the major, um, the major initiatives that we're putting out. But goodness gracious, look at the entire, you know, $369 billion bill um, or act. And there's so many opportunities there, um, you know, from individual incentives for folks to retrofit the houses. Um, and there are, I think, research, um, other research opportunities from other federal agencies as well. All right, we have another question that says, are there stories and narratives that will help convey climate science to the public and speak to existing values? Ah, I love this question. Who asked this? Um, that is Ed um, Carter. He is Ed, there. thank you. <laughs> um, let me just say, um, as you can imagine, in my role, both for NOAA as the Senior Advisor for Climate, but also as a Vice Chair of IPCC, I spent a lot of time um, communicating on climate change. And I, I personally don't have a penchant for remembering facts and figures and data. Um, and I, I got to assume I'm not alone. Um, in fact, the, the response that I get most consistently to um, you know, talks I give or conversations we have is a positive reception to stories, um, to, um, to things that um, elicit feelings. And it's very interesting, right? Because as a climate scientist, you don't think that, you know, talking about emotions and feelings is a natural place to go. But honestly, tapping into the feelings that people have about climate change is a tremendous motivator. Um, so, you know, um, and I learned this from, from some of the youth um, advocates who, I, who I've been working with. They're like, you know, please acknowledge that we're scared, acknowledge that we're angry, that, you know, we're making decisions right now about whether we should have children uh, because of this world that we've created. And, you know, that's a really powerful narrative. And, and so I, I would just say stories and narratives are probably the most effective way um, to convey information on climate change. And when you ask, are there stories and narratives that will help? Um, I think the answer is a resounding yes, but the ones that are most powerful are the ones that we ourselves are connected to. So um, I can't tell you which stories and narratives work because different stories and narratives work in different, in different places with different people and with you as the communicator. So when I, I'm in Western North Carolina right now, um, when I talk about the impacts to the mountains, it means something to me. So that comes across in the way that I communicate. And I, I, just, wanna, I just wanna encourage people to think about that as you, as knowledgeable scientists, um, think about communicating to your, your neighbors and um, the folks who you're trying to convince about the need to take action. And next, I'll call on Allison. Go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Um, thank you. Um, I'm really excited about this. Uh, I started working with uh, as a volunteer with NOAA's Digital Coast back in 2009. And I love the idea of the climate mapping for resilience and adaptation portal. Um, if we are allowed to make a recommendation, um, I'd love to see as part of the projects, uh, speaking about the climate uh, communications and the stories, maybe having part of a portal that says, how do you communicate to your elected officials and appointed officials of those, the ones that are making the local government decisions and those local government decisions are the ones that are putting communities more at risk if they're making them um, without education behind this on what their choices can make. Um, I have been doing this for a long time. I'm from Myrtle Beach. Um, and so we taught, we learned a long time ago that if they don't like the words climate change, find something that they will talk about. 
and then expand upon how that's changing itself. Like everybody knows storm surge and hurricane area. Well, we're going to have more of that. Oh, really? Okay. Well, let's talk about that. Um, there are ways around it. And there are other agencies that are putting together programs that are reaching out to even uh, more diverse um, groups of folks like uh, the National, the NDPTC, the National D Disaster Preparedness Training Consortium as part of, uh, under a FEMA grant, has a course that's climate adaptation for emergency managers to help emergency managers get in there and get into the local decisions to, so that they don't have to rescue as many people or that they don't have to do as much um, for um for their jobs and it saves money over time because we know that FEMA is running out of money and disasters are becoming um, more intense. Um, uh, they're going to be and you know, changing the patterns of what they're going through. And so having those kinds of repositories of things that are already out there have been tested would be a really good, I think, a really good place to store um, information for those coming for uh, being climate ready, having those agencies already that you're already working with because uh, NOAA works with uh, NDPTC and with um, FEMA and the like, and uh, getting it kind of like Digital Coast where you have all these folks that are doing things that we have already that have been worked on here, go borrow this or go go sign up for that or go, you know, take this format and and make it your own. So if if recommendations are welcome, then that's mine. And if not, I apologize. <laughs> no, obviously, this was a big invitation. The whole point of this is a big invitation to hear your perspectives. And I, I really uh, appreciate what you what you said, and we'll definitely um, take that back. And I also just want to um, support your, your like kind of early on statement about ways to communicate um, you know, this is a running theme, I guess, here in this in this conversation. Ways to communicate um, uh, that can be heard by the listener, and um, you know, I, I was just struck. You know, often um, not. It's actually changing a little bit. It's not so much lately, but certainly in the past 20 years that I've been working on climate change, you know, there are folks who just don't want to talk about climate, don't don't think it's important, don't believe in it. But if you say you know, if you talk about extreme events, like you were mentioning, um, Allison, that that everybody's all ears, you know, they can feel it. It's an impact that they, that is very tangible to them. Or talk about drought and the changes that we're seeing. Um, that's a pretty bipartisan um, challenge. And, um, and so there are definitely ways. But at the same time, I mean, I think it's, we are to the point where we can't skirt around the climate challenge. I mean, we really have to use our influence to, um, to have the conversations, some of which are difficult uh, with the people around us so that we can, um, we can make a difference and we can kind of make the transformation that's required in society. Um, so I, I agree and I thank you for that. The, one of the things I've found that's most effective is telling people, have, have you seen how many wineries are in these lower elevations that weren't there before? Your food placement is changing. Do you still wanna eat? Let's talk. And you know, there's a good news story that you can tell to everybody. Okay, maybe some people will be resistant to embracing a bill or IRA because they're coming out under this administration. But if you take a careful look at it, um, there are incentives like I've never seen before that provide additional incentives to someone who may be putting in, in place um, renewable energy production, say solar panels. Um, and you know, if you do that in a low-income community, there's additional incentives that um, you can receive. If you um, if you pay a living wage, there are addi additional incentives. If you hire apprentices, um, you know, one apprentice for every four workers, there are additional incentives you can receive. Like it's really geared towards. Oh, if you do it in an um, a fossil fuel reliant community additional incentives. So it's really kind of geared to bring people along with, you know, jobs and, and investment uh, into kind of a new approach to an entirely, you know, kind of new transformed society. I think that's powerful. Definitely. 
Um, and next we can call Peter Bergman. I have a question about um, whether the Climate Ready Nation has any um, legal power, may not be the right word, but you mentioned how a lot of the funding is going towards um, coastlines and making those more resilient. If you were to say, try to restore some like floodplains or tidal floodplains, how would you be able to acquire that land? Do you have power to change zoning laws or enact more um, legal restrictions on actions? Yeah, we don't directly. Um, I mean, we have some power, we have some regulatory power in NOAA about fisheries, right? So we give guidance about, you know, what are the right allocations of, you know, fish to be, that are allowed to be fished in a certain season. But in terms of coastal lands, NOAA doesn't have direct authority to do that. However, you know, the work that's envisioned for the coasts is very much to uh, provide um, support to um, municipalities, state and local governments, um, community groups, NGOs who, um, who need that support to be able to kind of tackle thorny issues like that. Um, you know, we would never, for example, be able to say, all right, our data show that uh, sea level rise is going to rise to this amount, so therefore this area of coastal Carolina is uh, therefore needing to be taken out of, you know, out of use and, um, you know, forced retreat of, you know, coastal populations. Um, I mean, that's a really thorny issue, and that's one that's best left to the coastal communities themselves to kind of figure out, but we can support them with data information tools um, and access to um, the things that will help them to make these decisions in the smartest way possible. So if I'm understanding correctly, um, the communities themselves would make these choices and then NOAA would serve as a um, advisory entity yeah. and, a, and a source of funding for these projects, but they don't make the decisions themselves. Yeah, and I'm not sure how far our funding would go into actually funding, say, managed retreat from the coasts. Um, and and honestly, in that example, I would imagine it's not. It, it could be communities that have the entire that have the right to make those decisions, but there's probably a whole cascading uh, connection to state entities as well, right? Alrighty, I think we'll call on Will next. Go ahead, I see your hands up. Hi, thank you. Um, just wanted to like follow up on that question. I, I know managed retreat is the, a loaded question, um, but I think something that I'm curious about, you know, I, I'm also North Carolina, I used to live on the Outer Banks and a big thing we talk about is federal flood insurance. Um, does this data that NOAA is collecting have any part in influencing the policy of federal flood insurance that many coastal communities rely on? Yeah, and um, I'll just share, you know, one of the things we're trying to achieve with some of the money, um, and I'm, apologies to those who don't want to hear this detail, but um, specifically with um, floods, flood, flood management, flood insurance, that information depends very much on what are um, precipitation frequency estimates, right? So floods really depend on how much um, precipitation we anticipate seeing based on recent trends. Um, but here's the thing, our current, it's, our current atlas of these um, estimates don't take into account future climate. They are just kind of an accounting of what's happened recently. And so they are woefully behind in helping people to plan for building codes in the future, for where to situate roads, because they don't currently take into account future climate change. So that's one of the things we're targeting for uh, with this money is we've got to bring climate change into the equation. And you know we do that um, we do that periodically in 
inside of NOAA, the Weather Service kind of leads this activity. And we're on kind of the 14th iteration of this going back however long, decades. Um, and they have a very slow and steady process that can be, you know, that is authoritative, can underpin legal challenges, can inform building codes and um, the like. But as I said earlier, right now we are building a tremendous amount of infrastructure with the investments from the bipartisan infrastructure law. And we can't just, we can't just use the old information. We have to kind of, um, you know, e even if it's on an experimental basis, build in future climate change so that we can make the best, um, the best choices we can based on our current kind of um, product, but also looking at climate change in the future. So that's, kind of, that's a good example of the kinds of things that we're doing with this new money, speeding that up and trying to figure out ways to get the right information into the hands of people who are making decisions right now. Thank you. And I think we have time for one more question from Kevin. He mentions, uh, you mentioned several times about getting information to the right audience. Considering the weather ready nation, there are still many private consult, uh, consultants repackaging NOAA's weather data and products and selling them to your target audience. How will you maintain your position as authoritative source for climate information? That is the question that um, <laughs> that keeps me up at night because honestly, I'm just, just to be totally honest with you, we are grappling with this. Um, we don't want to, like, we cannot be the sole provider, the sole authoritative voice for this. And yet for some of the data and observations and modeling, we are actually the source for um, that needs to be taken, built upon and used by a climate, um, a larger climate enterprise. Um, and right now, for example, it's a bit of a wild, wild west. We have we have private sector companies who are jumping in to meet the great demand from people who are saying, "Oh my gosh, you're right, climate change is affecting us. How am I going to, you know, protect the building stock in Madison, Wisconsin?" Um, and there are many companies who are jumping into this space, and some of them are quite good, and they have the right people on on staff, and they're using the right information, but not all of them are. Some of them are using the entirely wrong information for the application. And, um, and so I think a big, big thrust for us in the Climate Ready Nation work with private sector is actually working to make sure that, that um, we are educating about the right information. We're giving access to the right federally produced information um, that people can use for specific applications. And it's more challenging than Weather Ready Nation or the weather enterprise because you're dealing with a whole host of impacts and a whole host of geographies. Um, and um, and it's, it's quite specific, the actions that people would take for their place and for their priorities. So, um, so we are kind of trying to figure this out. We don't want to own this entire space. We want to support this space so that, you know, the army of practitioners that I keep talking about um, are enabled to work within their communities or in, in you know, the 30,000 communities across this nation to get the right information into the hands of people who are making important decisions. Um, and you know, I, I assume that a core piece of this will be um, to be the, an authoritative source for the provision of this core information but we're really kind of working it out the bound and and just like the weather the weather enterprise had to work out the boundaries right uh, and i think it's worked out quite well um, it's so interesting to to listen to weather forecasters on your local tv station talking about the european model and the noaa model um, you know they are very well informed and using a core set of capabilities that exist in noaa Well, I think at this time we will end. Um, so I wanna thank you, Co, for being here with us today. And we appreciate it so much for all you did for NOAA and the efforts you put forth for climate change that we face today and also what we will face in the future. Um, and also I want to thank you all for joining us for our first Global Change Seminar. 
and there will be another one in November. So look for messages on that one in the near future. Thank you so much, everybody. I'm looking at all the comments in the chat too. So um, thanks for, for taking the time to put that stuff in there. And uh, good, I'm fired up too. Let's do it. <laughs> Bye everyone. Thank you.